Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for today. Um, this webinar is part of our Unpacking Coaching webinar series that the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations hosts. Um, my name is Mary Louise Hummeter, and I'm going to be the host today. Um, our topic today is coaching with intention, making the most of the PVC cycle. So we're really going to focus on how you do coaching well. I could not be more excited than I am to have the three people we have with us today. So today we have three master veteran coaches, Kimberly Horth, Danielle Norton, and Stephanie Rapp. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then Kim will get us started. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as ML said, my name is Kimberly and I am a coach at Vanderbilt University. I do both classroom coaching and external coaching. So classroom coaching meaning that I go into early childhood classrooms where um, teachers are working with kids or virtually as the case may be right now. And I um, do my observations and I do my debriefs directly with those practitioners. I also do external coaching meaning that I support classroom coaches to implement PBC in their contexts. And I'll throw it over to Danielle. Thanks, Kim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Norton, and I am a family learning specialist at the National Center for Families Learning. It is a nonprofit that's based in Louisville, Kentucky. And the primary responsibility that I have at NCFL is that I support preschool teachers on, uh, within our FACE, which is Family and Child Education Division. Um, and I support preschool teachers um, on American Indian reservations. So we have 48 sites around the country that are specifically on American Indian reservations and I support 14 of those sites. And I'm really excited to be with you all today. Uh, and I will pass it to Stephanie. Thank you, Danielle. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Rapp. I am a classroom coach with Metro Nashville Public Schools. Uh, we work in partnership with Vanderbilt um, on the Education Innovation and Research Grant. So my primary job is to support classroom pre-K teachers um, in implementing the pyramid model, and we use practice-based coaching for that. So um, I'm glad to be here today with you all. So I'm going to take just a minute. Um, I assume that the majority of people on this webinar know what practice-based coaching is, but I'm going to take just a minute to do an overview in case you don't. Um, and But I do want to make the point that the webinar is not going to be how to do PVC because we're assuming most of y'all already know that, but it's how to do it intentionally and how to monitor and track whether you're doing it intentionally. So. Just as a real quick overview, um, practice-based coaching is a model of coaching that my colleagues and I develop um, around wanting to ensure that we had an effective strategy for supporting um, early childhood practitioners, home visitors, um, teachers, child care providers, um, to implement effective practices with fidelity. And so you'll notice at the center of the PBC model is effective teaching practices. So the PBC model can be used to support early childhood educators around any set of effective teaching pra practices. Today, we're gonna talk about how you use PBC to support um, teachers and home visitors around pyramid model practices, but you could also do it around early literacy practices or embedded instruction practices. Um, PBC, we believe, should be grounded in a collaborative partnership. So we don't see um, the coach as the coach as being the only expert. Rather, we see the coach as being the expert in the practices and the expert in supporting educators. And we see the teacher or the home visitor as being the expert about the children they work with and the families they work with and the settings in which they work. And so those experts come together um, to implement practice-based coaching, which is a cyclical process where 
we identify what the educators need um, strengths and needs are related to the practices that we're um, supporting that we develop goals and action plans for how the educator is going to learn to implement those practices. Um, we do observations and certainly in the time of COVID observations can take on many different forms from seeing teachers live to being on Zoom with teachers and home visitors to looking at videos. Um, and then we and when we're doing those observations, we're looking for evidence of the practitioner using those practices that are part of that goal and action plan. And then following the observation, we do some type of, um, or we do a meeting where we do reflection and feedback. And that, again, that reflection and feedback is grounded in what the teacher or home visitor has identified as their goal and the, the practices associated with that goal. And the whole process happens in a cyclical way. So as teachers meet one goal, they might, um, they might set a new goal um, and work on additional practices. Um, and it's driven by the collaborative partnership. That's a very quick overview. I think um, just really important for y'all to know is that we have, a, we have multiple randomized trials that have documented the effectiveness of PBC to support um, educators and home, visit home visitors across a range of practices. So that's your overview. And now we're gonna jump into how do you do PBC with intention, Kim. Okay, so when we think about doing PBC with intention, we really came to these four critical elements and we wanna make sure that they, they are all in place so that our practitioners are getting a high quality coaching experience. So the first element that we see is adherence to the coaching model, which we can also call fidelity. We especially, we definitely call it fidelity in our research world. Um, that means are all of the components of practice-based coaching occurring? Are we doing reflection and feedback? Is there an action plan? Are we using the tools that PBC is providing to us, for instance, a support a strengths and needs assessment, the observation notes, and those tools? The next element of intentional coaching is dosage, meaning how are teachers, how often, for how long are teachers getting coaching support? Then we look at quality of coaching, not just that coaching components are all present, but what is happening within those coaching meetings to make it high quality. And then lastly, we think about the effectiveness of coaching from the perspective of the coachee. The coachee is participating in coaching because they are trying to grow in their strengths and grow in the use of the intentional teaching practices. Um, they will, uh, they're going to have a high quality experience when they're really bought in to what we're doing. And so we wanna make sure that we're taking the coachee's experience into, um, into account as we're designing how we're implementing coaching. So going to go into a little bit more depth into each of those critical components. So this first one here, adherence to the coaching model. So we know that there's a lot of different coaching models out there. Of course, we're going to be focusing on practice-based coaching today um, and the components that are involved in it. And we want to make sure that coaching is working for the practitioner. But in order to make sure that it's working, we have to make sure that we're doing coaching as it's intended. For instance, if you coach on the pyramid model, like most of my work focuses on, you want to make sure that teachers are, are the kids are growing in their use of social skills. Well, we know that they're gonna grow into the use of social skills if teachers are teaching pyramid model practices. And we make sure that that happens by using a tool like the teapot or the teaching pyramid observation tool. It's the same thing with coaching. In order to make sure that coaching is working, we have to look at are we doing coaching the way that it should be done. So we use that by taking fidelity. So fidelity simply means that all of the critical components or strategies of PVC are happening. So are we doing a strengths and needs assessment to know what the teacher um, is already doing and where that teacher or practitioner can grow? Are we doing action planning? Is there a focused observation related to that action plan? Is the coachee getting time to reflect on their implementation of practices? And then are we as the coach providing feedback? 
when all of those critical components there are present, we know that the coachee is getting support that it's effective and responsive to the coaching needs. Um, when I, I, before I started coaching on um, using practice-based coaching, I did coach before on language and literacy with another program. Um, we just called it coaching. There was not any particular name and uh, there, there would not have been fidelity. There would not have been anyone to tell me if I was implementing everything as it was designed because there were no guidelines around what was designed. And I thought that I was had great relationships with the people I was working with and I could see their growth. Um, but I don't know if my coaching was um, as effective as it could have been because I didn't have these uh, the support around what does it mean to be a coach and I didn't have anyone giving me feedback on my coaching and I really now that I know about practice-based coaching I would love to go back and do some elements of that job again and just get to see uh, what a difference um, a supportive framework could provide. So we measure fidelity um, by by actually having someone do an observation on our coaching meetings. And so we usually don't have an extra person join our coaching meetings. We Rather, we do an audio or a video recording of what happens during coaching. And if you're coaching right now using Zoom like I am, it's really easy to just set, the, set an audio recorder there um, and have that record right alongside your meeting. Then we pass along those recordings to someone else. That person could be a peer. I have peers listen to my audio set, uh, recordings of my sessions and they give me feedback. They're not my supervisor, but there are other, co there are other experts on practice-based coaching and I get a lot out of hearing feedback related to my implementation. Um, they use that same coaching log that I've used in my sessions of my coaching log lists out everything that I'm supposed to be doing as a coach with my teachers or my practitioners they use that same exact log as they listen to my recording to check and make sure that I'm doing all of the things that I should be doing. In our research world, we consider 80% or higher of, of all of the strategies that I should be using present um, to be at fidelity. So 80% is sort of our magic number. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. Our next element here is dosage. So dosage, dosage is all about how often coaching sessions are happening, the length of coaching sessions, um, and you can measure all of that pretty easily on your coaching log. There should be a place in your coaching log just to keep note of that. And it's helpful to look at that um, to make sure that teachers are getting, or your practitioners are getting coaching that is meeting their needs. So I coach mostly in the research world, as I said, so my dosage is somewhat prescribed in that I have to see my teacher every week or every other week or something like that, that I don't really get to do any sort of individualization for. What I do um, and individualize for related to dosage is I also um, coach on, when I coach on the top of the pyramid or that tier three level intervention, I uh, make, my coaching sessions usually last longer. I usually spend more time in the classroom because getting an understanding of an individual child's challenging behavior usually takes longer than just watching a circle time or just attending center time. I usually try to get more of an understanding of the length of what happens all day long. And so that's a really um, frequent time where I see my dosage might change. That teacher's still getting an observation. That teacher's still getting a, a coaching meeting with me. So we're doing the full cycle, but that the length of the observation um, or the length of the debrief, depending on paperwork that we might need to complete, does vary, and that's appropriate. The dosage doesn't have to be the same for every coachee because different coachees will have different needs given their context and given their experience level. Then we look at assessing quality, and assessing whether a coaching meeting is high quality is not a yes or no choice, and if it were, ML and I would be adding it to our research projects because it would give us a lot of really valuable information. But looking at quality is not that simple as it is just saying, yes, feedback happened. Um, so when we think about quality, we think about these elements. What's the coach's tone? Is what the coach communi is communicating to the coachee clear? Does the coachee have enough time to talk, to share what's going on, to support that collaborative partnership? Is the coach responding to the coach's concerns and questions. So 
I can usually say when these things are happening and I, and it's a great thing to get feedback on and to give feedback on when I do external coaching. Um, because it gets at this deeper level to take just simply implementing at fidelity, implementing all of the elements of PBC to the next level to be a really strong and supportive coach. And I will bounce it over here to Stephanie. Um, real quick before Stephanie goes, I just want to come in on a couple of things that Kim said, one of which is you were talking about when you were a coach that you were in the field before you came to work on our projects. You didn't, you weren't really trained to be a coach. You didn't have a model of coaching that you were doing. And I think that that's something we see in the field a lot, that if you ask people, are you doing coaching um, uh, programs will say yes. But if you say, how much are you coaching or who are you coaching or how do you decide how much to coach? What strategies do you use? Programs often don't know. And that's what we're trying to get away from because when we don't know if we're doing it and we don't know if we're doing it well, then we wouldn't be expecting to see change in teachers. So I think being able to track what we're doing and know what coaching model we use um, is really important. All right, Stephanie. Thank you, ML. Thank you, Kim. So as Kim mentioned a little bit earlier, the fourth element of intentional coaching is that the coaches see the effectiveness of the coaching cycle. This means that our supports to coaches need to be differentiated to meet their individual needs. Um, and it's therefore important for the coaching cycle to be complete or coaches, coaches won't necessarily see coaching as effective. So they might not see the value in spending their limited planning time hearing what you think that they should work on. If you are, um, they, they uh, teachers and coaches deserve to feel like they're getting a good value for the price they pay. And they might not see that value if you're working on an action plan that they didn't really pick. Um, so from day one, um, in my experience working with a veteran teacher, uh, I knew what I thought that she should work on. Uh, we were, I'm coaching pyramid models. So, you know, I thought she, she needed to put in a cozy corner and start teaching students to manage feelings. Um, and it was an important idea for me to learn as a new coach that effective coaching isn't, you know, writing up a list um, of everything that she could change, you know, just trust me and do these things and your life will be easier. Um, and because I didn't uh, force any of those, any of my priorities on her, uh, we were able to build the collaborative relationship that is needed for longer term effective coaching. Um, by the end of our second year together, we finally got around to what I had my eye on from the beginning and what I considered to be priorities. Um, and she signed up for an extension year, um, you know, because of COVID, we're extending the study a, a third year. And she signed up for that. And I think, you know, that was a good indication that she felt coaching was effective and worth her time. Uh, I followed the practice-based coaching cycle with a first-year teacher uh, in a blended classroom, but my support for her looked very different. Uh, there were more in-between visits or a higher dosage. I did a lot more modeling and in the moment verbal supports. Um, and at the end of the year, um, I wanted to hear from her what supports she felt were helpful which opened up the opportunity for some feedback and she appreciated you know that my feedback was non-judgmental and that even though she um you know she went through some very difficult uh times in her first year um you know she cried at a lot of our our debrief meetings um but despite those challenges she really saw the value and the effectiveness of coaching she said that she you know, wouldn't have made it through her first year uh, without coaching. So she really saw the effectiveness um, in the coaching. So the, the, you know, my experiences with the veteran teacher, with the brand new teacher, 
um, in order to be effectiveness and intentional with them, to be effective and intentional with both of them, um, the teachers needed different types of support, different dosages and some differentiated uh, support. So on the next slide, we, um, there are a few different um, ways to, to get feedback. We, we wanna get feedback because we wanna know that the coachee sees our support, our coaching as effective. Um, so one way to gauge um, their, their perspective on the effectiveness of our coaching is to seek their feedback. So one way is at the end of the year, um, working together, you might remind your coachee of the different strategies that you used. So, you know, remember I modeled for you some, I created different materials for you, I um, tried some in the moment verbal or gestural uh, support to use the practice in the moment and ask which strategies they feel were most supportive. Uh, you could send an anonymous survey to your coaches, um, and those are important to do because once you know, you know, this particular teacher, or this particular coachee really values that in the moment support because, you know, as a coach, I can sometimes see things that they're not necessarily noticing. This, this teacher really values that support, whereas this teacher you know, by seeking her feedback, I learned that she really doesn't like to be um, supported in the moment. She wants me to give her feedback afterwards in a debrief meeting. Um, knowing that and, and what types of supports teachers really value uh, helps you to be more intentional and more effective with your, with your coaches. Um, and finally, it's important to remember that um, coachee feedback is really embedded into the action planning process. So the coachee is the one determining which goals to work on and will tell you how they want you to support them. Um, and so those are just a few ways that you can seek feedback from your coachees in order to be an intentional coach. Hey, Stephanie, um, someone asked a question about um, how do you measure the tone clarity and responsiveness? So Kim brought this up. And then one of, one of the things I was going to respond to this question was that we should be as comfortable asking, we sh that we want teachers to reflect on their practices. We as coaches need to be able to reflect on our practices. And I think it's that parallel process so if we're asking teachers to reflect on how they're doing, we also ought to let, we also ought to model for them how we can reflect on what we're doing, right? So I think things around um, responsiveness and clarity are things we can just ask coaches directly if we're being responsive, if we're, if we're being clear in our feedback. I think tone, and then I really want to know if any of y'all have any other ideas. I think tone is a harder one that tone feels really personal and how do you give a coach feedback on their tone and I often think about when I'm supporting teachers and I want to work on tone with them you know their tone with children I ask them what they think children hear so what do they think the children hear when they say something to them so that you can get it tone maybe in a less directive way. But anyway, I don't know. Any of y'all can jump in here before Danielle takes over if you have any other suggestions. Something I was just going to say, oh. oh, go ahead, Danielle. Oh, I was just going to say when, if you have a colleague or when you have colleagues that are, um, um, you know, listening to your video, uh, well, recording tape or looking at your video and giving you feedback on um, a form that we'll talk about in just a second, um, I think it's important to always keep in mind, um, I would ask the the relationship, like how is your relationship with the coachee and the coach? Because if you have, it, this is just natural. If, you're, if I'm a coach and I've been co uh, coaching a teacher for some years, we have a different relationship. We might have different banter, something that you may not know when you're observing, like, oh, that was kind of harsh. Maybe just a joke 
and you don't know that because you don't know our relationship mm -hmm. type of thing, right? So I think it's also very important to keep that in mind that tone is very subjective. And if it's something that you're observing, um, uh, if, if Kim, Kim came to me or, or I came to Kim to, you know, hey, can you give me some feedback? And she's like, girl, why did you make that joke? Like, that was harsh. And I could say, oh, let me tell you some background, you know, just to keep that um, in mind when you're actually helping your colleague and getting better in their coaching um, practices. I just wanted to say that. Yeah. I think another thing that I, that is really important is that when you're addressing, when you're supporting a coach, so if you're in the position of being an external coach or being a peer and supporting another coach to you, uh, another, another person who coaches, um, it's really important to make sure that fidelity of the, of PBC is in place first, because that means that the coachee is getting the experience as it's designed and then addressing elements of quality. Um, mm -hmm. I think another, a, another way to do that that hasn't already been mentioned is you can listen to your own recordings. We are usually our own worst critics mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Um, and so sometimes what I would do is if I had a session that I felt a little iffy about with a teacher, I would sometimes play that audio recording back to myself as I was driving home or when I got back to the office and I was um, getting ready to reflect for the next week, I will listen back to my recording and give myself some feedback. And that's, I think where that, where those, pieces um, around tone, around responsiveness also come in um, because I have the context. I know that relationship. Um, and I can usually give myself some feedback um, to, to tweak for the following week. Um, another thing I was thinking about um, with relation to quality is that just because a session is, all the elements happened doesn't automatically make it high quality. Um, and just because a session is high quality doesn't mean that everything necessarily happened. And I think that Danielle is going to give us a really good insight into what that's going to look like in her section next. You ready for that? I am. Such high praise. Okay. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> on the slide that you see, there are, um, there's two different templates that were available to you on uh, uh, that, um, the resources, we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but on the left side, you see the classroom coaching log. And then on the right side, you see the early intervention practitioner coaching log. And that log, the early uh, intervention one is a log for people that are, um, that do home visits and things of that nature. Uh, but we're going to focus more on the classroom coaching log uh, for a little bit. So if you want to go to the next slide, it'd be great. So we're going to dig a little deeper into this coaching law that we have been referring to um, previously. So you see on the left hand side, you see it says in the green observation strategies. So there are definitely essential strategies on the observation strategy side that you will want to as a coach um, implement every time that you are observing, listening um, uh, with your coachee. So the first one would be to Observe. Um, <laughs> you definitely want to, to, that's a strategy that should always be used um, as, um, as a strategy that's an essential strategy. Um, the second one that you uh, all need, always need to use is to uh, collect data, right? So you want to make things as um, objective as possible when you are coaching uh, people, okay? Uh, it's not a thing about I feel or I think, you know, it's what you have seen with your own eyes and, and very objective data. Those are two of the, um, the ones that you need to really try to focus on when you're observing and um, observation strategies. I'm not saying that the other ones that are listed there and I won't read them because y'all can read, uh, but I'm not saying those aren't important, or those aren't relevant and those aren't great to use, but the two that are starred right there are the ones that you need to use every time that you are um, observing your coachee. Okay, so on the right side of this template is the debrief strategies. So that's after, that's like I said, you, you observed your coachee and you um, are now going to meet with your coachee, you set a time, and you have some debrief strategies there. And you see all those that are listed. But there are four essential debrief strategies that need to be implemented every time that you have a debrief session. And so the first one uh, is reflective conversation. And literally, you're going to do what 
the words reflective conversation says. You're going to help the teacher reflect. Okay. So you, you're always with everything that we do with practice based coaching, you're coming from a strengths based approach. Okay. And you're going to ask really great open ended questions and open ended prompts. So, for instance, if I say, uh, Stephanie, how do you, how, the time that I was there observing you, how do you think you did? Good. Okay, what does that mean? Instead of, at, I could have asked her, hey, Stephanie, while I was there, what was your favorite um, uh, thing that you did that you implemented? And then Stephanie's going to tell me, why was it your favorite? So we're going to have a conversation and I'm helping her get deeper into her thought process and being reflective. Okay, so those open-ended questions are, are really, really important. The next is constructive feedback. Notice it says feedback and not criticism, okay? Because there's a difference. So constructive feedback, it helps teachers expand or adjust their practices. It's whole goal, all right? So you're gonna start with what you observed. That's why collecting data is super, super important and, and collecting data in the most uh, objective way possible. Um, a little side note, I was telling them while we were preparing for this um, webinar for you all today, um, a quick story that I learned the hard way. Uh, you know how we, you know when you're a classroom teacher that it's super important when you're making observation notes, A, that your objective is possible, and B, you know, if you lay something down, are you going to be comfortable for whoever to read it, okay? So this is my lesson learned. I, I made notes and I'm really, really bad when I'm um, observing teachers, when I'm in the classroom, I tend to lay things down because I'm squirrely like that. And I wrote something that it wasn't harsh in my mind, but it was a subjective note that I made to myself or a note that I wrote and the teacher you know, saw the notes and she handed them to me and she talked to me about it and it really hurt her feelings. And I had to, to deal with that and build a better relationship and I learned that to be very, 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 very objective when you're writing notes and that you want to make sure you have it in your mind. If, if I write this and I show my notes to, which I always usually did anyway, because I want to be transparent. But it, um, if, I, if I write this and I have my coachee read this, will he or she be okay with this? All right. So that's just a little tidbit that I just want to reiterate and kind of throw, there, throw it out there to you all. I'm sure a lot of you all have had experiences, you just live and learn with that. So back to constructive feedback, so the, um, going back to collecting data. So you're basing you know, your, your feedback on data and you're gonna share uh, info and suggestions. And you, this is another um, uh, place that you're always gonna ask open-ended questions. And you're gonna ask the teacher you know, to reflect because you wanna know first, what is it, what was the mind process? What was the mind thought or flow that their teacher had when doing something that you know is like, whoa, what are you doing, okay? So you can say something as simple as, so tell me a little bit more about blank or something you might wanna try is blank. What do you think about that, okay? So it's constructive. You're not you know, beating somebody over the head like, you suck, you're not doing that because that's not helpful. But it is, but you are giving you know, constructive feedback in the whole goal, obviously. It's to support that teacher to get better at her, he or hers, she or he's teaching practices. Okay? The next strategy, that's an essential strategy of the DB strategies, are, is definitely goal setting and action planning. Um, Stephanie already said earlier that action planning and goal setting is, should be um, definitely with the coachee uh, in mind and because you're, they'll have more buy-in. Uh, goal setting may not happen you may not set a new goal every time that you meet and debrief with your coachee, but that doesn't mean that you don't need to look at your action plan and the goals that you are setting with that action plan every time, because you want to keep track. I, I call it keeping me honest, keeping us honest. We made this goal. We made this action plan. How are we going to, you know, uh, achieve that goal? Where are we in this? And maybe you need to, you find out, mm, I'm seeing, you know, from this observation day, maybe we maybe missed a step. Maybe we need to go a step, you know, back. Or it, it could be the opposite way. I had a teacher that was knocking goals. I mean, like, bam, bam, bam. And I'm like, clearly, we're making these goals a little too easy. Let me challenge you a little bit. Let's think a little deeper, right? The last um, strategy that's an essential strategy is giving supportive feedback. Um, I will be honest with you. When I first started 
coaching. This one was the hardest for me uh, because when you, um, I played a lot of sports growing up and don't necessarily get a lot of supportive feedback in the coaching world. At least I didn't back in the day. I'm old school. I'm old. Uh, you got more constructive criticism. Okay. You didn't get a lot of that's great. You're doing a great job. Sometimes you did, but not really. But it's super important to have supportive feedback for teachers because teachers and you know, your coaches need to know that they are doing things well. This is a tough profession. They need to know what it's doing, what they're doing well, so they can even further their strengths, right? Um, you're, going to, you're going to ask prompts or say prompts like, it was great to see blank, or I saw you do blank. It was a perfect example. It's not a perfunctionary praise like, oh, you did a good job. A good job at what? We do the same thing with children. We don't want teachers or our coaches to say to children all the time, great job. They need to know what they did a great job because now they're like, you internalize, oh, I did a great job if it's a child at using my walking feet to get to the line. I, I, like, that, I, I like the way that I feel right now. So I'm gonna keep doing that. It's the same thing, that's just human nature. You wanna hear that supportive feedback. And it's important as a coach that you give your coachee uh, supportive feedback. So those are the four essential strategies for debriefing. Again, there's others that are listed, but these four should be uh, used every time that you debrief. I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions that need to be answered, Mary, uh, ML? Well, actually I do have one, so thank you. Um, so, and this could be Danielle for you or Stephanie or Kim, but you're talking a lot about feedback. And one of the things I was thinking when you were talking was, we know that every effective model of changing adult behavior, whether it's coaching in education or football or soccer or whatever, it involves a feedback component, right? That mm -hmm. you need feedback, both positive and, um, I mean, both supportive and constructive. And yet I, I find that coaches have a lot of trouble giving feedback. And I wonder if y'all have some suggestions for how coaches can mm -hmm. feel more comfortable giving both supportive and constructive feedback and how PBC kind of makes it easier to do that. I think for me, I'll answer, I'm sorry, Stephanie, I'm, I'm real bad about, bam. Uh, <laughs> I think for, for me, what I love about PBC is that the, the emphasis on the observation strategies when it comes to collecting data. Mm -hmm. Data is your friend, okay? Data, you can literally say at 2.23, uh, if Stephanie's my coachee and I'm in her classroom, Stephanie, um, uh, yelled, because that's something that's ob objective, uh, yelled at the student for biting. I don't know, something that I'm, I just made up. Um, and I know that, oh, I need to have this tough conversation because clearly that's not the way we need to do. When you have the more data and objective data that you have, you can go back to data. And it's that is your friend. Data helps you have those, start to have those conversations, especially when it comes to the constructive feedback uh, side of things. Because it is, uh, for most people, it is, I'm, I'm weird like that. Again, I don't know why it was easier for me to do constructive feedback than supportive, whatevs. But for most people, it is, you know, that constructive feedback is, it's, it's you're scared about it. You don't want to hurt your relationship that you're building. But use that data. Data, you know, when you're objective and you have data to, to say, this is what you do. And it's even better when you have a video. Oh, when you have a video, you can see, like, let me show you this. Um, I, to me, that's, that is so helpful. Danielle, um, I'll just echo what you said, um, that having objective notes or data is important. And as a new coach, it was, um, I, I had to really practice that my note taking skills um, and through the support that I got from my external coaches like Kim um, and, and the feedback that they gave me on my coaching, that was invaluable. Um, but it was really important for me to always, you know, write down objectively what I saw happen and then what was the impact of the teacher's actions on the students. Mm -hmm. um, and so that during the constructive feedback portion, uh, I, it was just, you know, here's what happened, here's what you did and here's how the kids responded. Um, and 
I'll also just add, and I'm still getting better at constructive feedback, but it's something that's scary for new coaches. Um, and I don't know if it's ever going to be super comfortable, but after two years now um, coaching and, and giving constructive feedback, it has gotten a lot easier and just more matter of fact. Um, and once you've laid the groundwork of here's all the, you know, or here's a concise, um, but uh, descriptive number of things that you're doing well, here's all this supportive feedback. Um, I also noticed this happen and, and shifting kind of seamlessly into the constructive feedback and, um, and that's just become easier the more that I've done it. You're on mute, Kim. <laughs> you caught me really fast that time. Thank you. I knew you were coming. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I, everything that Danielle and Stephanie said, I have implemented that myself too and found a lot of success with that. Um, I would say that when we say data and you're collecting data, that doesn't just mean that you're taking, for instance, teapot data. Think about how quotes are data writing down a conversation that happened between two kids or a teacher and kids, um, that can all be data too. Um, and then my only other quick tip would be to use reflection as your opening to feedback. So Danielle gave some really good examples um, earlier, but that's um, a strategy that I've really used, especially when I feel like the thing I need to address in my constructive feedback is, is a big deal. Um, not all constructive feedback situations are a big deal. Um, but when I do feel like I've got something that's just a little bit stickier, I usually start with a, with a reflection first. Like, so tell me about X situation. Oh, and what, what, what uh, made you try that strategy? And I just try to get a little bit more background information. And that usually gives me an opportunity through what the teacher's saying to go into my constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. Y'all can see why I wanted these three coaches on this webinar. Y'all are amazing. So, Danielle, I think you have one more slide. So I'm going to to you. Yeah, I do. Um, so just uh, I know our, our time is getting getting short, which is crazy to me because I feel like we just started. But this is a sample coaching log um, of um, let's say it's me. Uh, it's me, and let's say Kim is. Um, she listened to my video recording or saw my videotape and, uh, and, and listened several times to my different coaching um, debrief sessions that you can see the dates up here. And I want um, you all that are participating in the webinar today, if you wouldn't mind, I want you to look at the four, the four essential strategies, the ones that are starred, reflective conversation, constructive feedback, goal setting or action planning and um, supportive feedback. I want you to look at just from the first date that you see there to the last date. Tell me if you see or put in the chat box uh, or the chat box, I think, um, any patterns. What's a pattern that you see? Let's talk about one since we're short of time. Constructive feedback every time someone said. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Anything else? Problem solving. We all got tons of feedback. Very important. Problem solving, problem solving. <laughs> so I, I'm owning this, this sample coaching log because I actually created it. And this literally would have been a sample coaching log of my first year of teaching because I shared with you all how, for whatever reason, it was um, a challenge for me to give supportive feedback. And if you notice on this, um, the coaching log that, yeah, I, I every time can give constructive feedback, but I wasn't as consistent in giving supportive feedback. And that helped me to get better at, you know, implementing at least the four essential strategies every single time. And it doesn't happen overnight. I had to give myself, you know, grace and get out of that um, mindset of how I was coached in, in the sporting world versus this is a completely different type of coaching, right? Uh, so uh, this is just an example and uh, some patterns that I wanted to, to show you all. But I just want to emphasize that this is such a valuable tool to use. It's a valuable tool to use with your colleagues when you have, you know, coaching friends, 
um, and, and building your coaching community that you all can support each other. And just like Kim said, listening to yourself, we are our own works critic. That also helped me to hear, hear back conversations like, ooh, I missed that opportunity. Or, ooh, you know, if I just asked this one question a little different, it would have gotten a different, you know, a deeper uh, reflecting time for the coachee. So um, I want to pass it on uh, back to Stephanie. It's going to sh oh, no, I'm sorry. I have one more slide. Sorry. Oh, this is definitely important. Uh, uh, fidelity from a distance. So over the majority of us, I'm going to soon on our call, um, if not all of us, are having to coach teachers um, and support teachers from a distance, right? Super challenging if you're used to being able to go face-to-face -face and go into classrooms uh, with, and have conversations with your coachee. So question is, which essential strategies can be implemented from a distance? And it's all of them but it's going to look different. Things that you could do face to face and have conversations with or even observe is gonna obviously look different. So we just have to be flexible, definitely flexible with that. Um, hopefully that you are, are able, those of you, you know, who are coaching, that you can ask your coachee if they're using a virtual platform, if you can sit in on one of their sessions that they're having live with, with, um, with their students. And to see, you know, what things are, are within the pyramid model, because it absolutely need, can be implemented uh, virtually as well. Uh, it just had to be really, really creative and really creative in, you know, first developing that relationship, obviously, with your coachee. That, that, that's a lot, you know, virtually. It, it, it can be difficult, but just being there to listen. You know, we all are going through tough times and, and teachers, classroom teachers, God bless. I have a lot of friends that are classroom teachers. I, I just honestly cannot imagine. So just being there, develop that relationship, being um, creative in how you imp uh, can implement the PBC with Fidelity from a distance. And then, like I said, you know, what additional strategies you can use? I literally did this last week with one of my uh, coaches, one of my teachers I support. Um, she was having a difficult time with um, one of her children on, she used Zoom, they use Zoom for the uh, learning platform. And the child would just, all over the place and the, even though the, the caregiver, the family member was there, it's just, he was just all over the place. And so I was like, okay, what is your reaction? And we did role playing. You know, I pretended like I was a child and she was obviously the teacher cause that's what she is. And um, I, I, when we stopped in between, I was like, okay, you did this. Let's think about, can you do that? You know, let's think about other strategies and just talking through strategies. Uh, that she can do to implement to help that child, um, you know, be successful as much as possible because we all know Zoom learning for a three, four, and five-year-old. I mean, I'm just saying, but we're doing the best we can, right? Uh, but just being really, really flexible, really strategic, really creative, and still supporting our, our um, coaches. So now, for real, I'm going to pass it on over to Stephanie. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Danielle. Mm -hmm. So, I thought I was coaching with intention, but something was off. So ML mentioned earlier um, that there are many different coaching models, um, but practice-based coaching has some essential components to it. There's um, action planning and goal setting, observation, reflection, feedback, um, and they all take place, of course, within a collaborative relationship. I now have had experience as both the coachee and as a coach. Um, I had two different coaches during my time teaching pre-K, and I know that they had some training on practice-based coaching, but there really was not fidelity to the coaching model. I mean, they, they didn't record meetings afterwards, or there was no sort of system for tracking fidelity of the coaching model. Um, so my coaches would sort of pop in unannounced. Um, we would have kind of free flowing conversations after visits without necessarily referring to action plans. I didn't always hear constructive feedback. Um, they did help me tremendously. I, I was a brand new teacher and, you know, <laughs> felt like I was barely treading water. Um, and they were, they were really helpful, 
but the support just seems a little less structured um, and less intentional. Uh, so now I'm coaching pre-K teachers as part of a study where coaching fidelity is checked regularly. And I really see the value of that PBC cycle. Teachers know when to expect me. They know what practices I'm there to observe. Um, the debrief meetings become predictable. They know that they're going to have a chance to reflect, that I'm going to give feedback, supportive and constructive, that we're going to reference the plans and it's going to be, you know, the observation and the, and the debrief meetings are focused, not all over the place. Uh, and the result, I think, from my experience, is that the teachers develop an appreciation for the true collaborative nature of coaching and see that it's worth their time. Good, that was perfect. So I have one question to throw out there to you guys before we wrap up. I've been trying to answer questions in the chat, but one question that came up was if y'all had any um, recommendations for how to take good notes when you're doing observations. So I don't know if someone wants to jump in with some ideas about that. I'll just develop um, some shorthand. So I, T is always teacher, C is always child, P is always a peer. So not the child that I'm focusing on, but someone else who's around. And mm -hmm. I'll use those sorts of things. Um, when if whatever the targeted practice is like i will i'll make a box on that or i'll circle it or i'll highlight it to make sure that that like so i know where the targeted um practices are occurring and i think that that is hugely beneficial i write a lot of quotes down i find that quotes usually give me enough information rather than writing down a narrative of the actions that have taken place um and those are some of the strategies that i use and I'll add in, uh, we use a focus observation note sheet and it's printed with two columns. Um, on the left side is uh, what I observed and on the right side is what I want to share uh, with the teacher. And what I like to do, and as I mentioned earlier, is to write down um, what, I, what I observed and then on the in the other column write down, you know, what the response was or what the impact was on the children. And I think I'll just also add, it's super helpful and it takes some time, I think, to get in this habit, but it's super helpful to have your blinders on um, so that you're only focused on what the action plan is. I mean, if something really <laughs> remarkable ha happens, good or bad, you can make a note, but it's helpful to me when I'm in the classroom or on Zoom uh, to really be focused and looking for the specific practices that the teacher's working on um, at the time. Perfect. All right, um, I'm gonna kind of wrap us up. I wanna say a couple of things. First of all, you guys are amazing. Y'all are fabulous coaches and you were fabulous to have on this webinar because you have such great real life experience. Thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to say that there were um, several comments and questions, and Danielle talked a little bit about it, about the virtual issue. And we are actually planning a webinar kind of last minute for next month where we're going to, it's going to be something about coaching in the time of COVID. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of these issues related to virtual coaching and how do you do a teapot if you can't get in the classroom. Um, and so we're, we'll probably be getting something up about that in the next week or so, but watch for that because I think we'll answer a lot of your virtual COVID kind of questions in that webinar. So anyway, um, thank you to the uh, to the panelists. Y'all were fabulous, as I said. And Victor, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for their wonderful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post webinar survey by typing the web address shown on this slide into your internet browser. Your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. 
We also invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org, to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources, and more. Thank you to our funder for making this webinar possible. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.